Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry we're a couple minutes late, but according to that clock, we're really early. So anyway, if you'll have a seat, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Representative Green, would you uh, open us up with a prayer, please? Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your guidance. And Father, we just pray that we will do the people's business and that we, that we will continue to work hard for this state. Father, we just thank you now as we go through the day. Go with us through this week. Bless those that are in need, those that are hurting. And Father, just guide us and direct us now in the coming days. And we ask all of this in our Lord and Savior's name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Dean Green. Okay. Uh, we we got a lot of folks and a lot of territory to cover this morning, so we're going to ask you to list, help move right along as quickly as we can, and uh, we'll go ahead and begin with our ladies. Come on up. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to begin with HR. 1022 is LC 500787S, and this particular bill is um, a resolution constitutional amendment, and it allows basically a statewide floating homestead for all state, I mean, I'm sorry, for all county, city, and school boards. Um, the local governments have to vote it in, and then it'll be on referendum, um, and then um, HB 1185 is the enabling legislation for this. Um, it gives a base year tax exemption with a, an adjustment based on something like consumer price index. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Chair Lady uh, Camp, uh, will your constitutional amendment in any way threaten or undermine public school budgets or funding? It will not because local school boards would have to vote on this particular measure and then the local residents of the municipality would also vote so it would not be an opportunity the school board would have to approve it thank you okay you have another question chairman martin chairman camp thank you for bringing the bill isn't it true that what you're trying to do here is just remove what could be an, a yearly delay um, like last year we got a session there were some local governments that wanted to implement floating homestead but they had to wait for us to meet again to allow them to do that and what you're trying to do is just allow that once if the voters of the state approve it so that then local governments have their uh, absolute control in doing that isn't that what you're trying to do is eliminate the delay yes chairman that is correct and i appreciate your work on this bill as well and and that is the case um, many times local municipalities um, are basically curtailed from doing floating homesteads because we're only in session for 40 days a year. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Representative Hagen. If you will, when you present, tell us where it is on the blue sheet. It'll make it quicker for us to get through those. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have House Bill 927. It's on the second page, about halfway down. I presented this bill um, a couple weeks ago. It was recommitted to Game, Fish, and Parks Committee where um, a change was made, and that change is um, to extend the sunset uh, for allowing hunting with um, air guns. It's currently in the law, and the committee um, sub uh, extends that sunset to 2028. So that, that's the change in that bill. Good. I have a question. Uh, Jim Smith over here. Thank you. My, I'm over here to the wall. My question is, to you is, do they get the exemption because they're wearing pink? I think they should, but that's not covered in this bill. <laughs> Thank you. No other questions. Thank you. Go ahead, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the committee. I am presenting HB 1195. It's on the last page, page six, the second from the bottom. And this would give a $4,000 income tax credit to individuals in high growth tech jobs in rural counties that go through a workforce certification program. 
I don't see any questions. Thank you, Representative Kendry. Thank you. Okay. Great, Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, presenting before you HB 941, it's on page two, about the middle section of page two. What this bill does is it allows school systems to count pre-K programs in their capital outlay for building. Currently, uh, pre-K programs are not allowed to be counted towards that space. The systems that are using that uh, that, that, that space that uh, they could use in the, uh, with this bill for capital outlay. Okay, no questions. Thank you, sir. Chokas, Chairman Chokas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I bring before you uh, HB 808. It's on page five, about midway down under structured rule. And this bill simply changes the uh, tax exemption uh, from 7,500 to 20,000 on tangible personal property. Okay, we have a question. Is that Whip Park over there? Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. Is it not true that this bill would reduce local tax digest without any sort of revenue replacements? I'm sorry, I couldn't exactly hear that. Is it not true this bill would reduce local ta tax digest without revenue replacements? It would, uh, what it would do is uh, just bring the threshold up from $7,500 to $20,000. Is there a fiscal note on the bill? It's not necessary. Thank you. I have another question, Chairman Stevens. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Isn't it true that this is personal property like your desk and that kind of stuff that's not resale property that is being taxed currently today and that is insignificant when it comes to the digest? That's absolutely correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that question. Chairman Hawkins has a question. Would, yeah. Would this include boats? Because boats is counted. No, first. sir. Uh, Unfortunately. Darn. Boats and darn. airplanes. <laughs> I, I fought for one. it, but we couldn't get it. Uh, not that uh, I have one. Thank you. No other questions. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Chairman Perkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was a good try, Chairman Hawkins. On the first page, fifth down, first page, fifth down, H.R. 1116. This is our annual conveyance on state properties. It's been thoroughly vetted. I'd be happy to go with you in granular detail on the 18 page bill, but uh, it's the one we do annually, and I'll stop talking unless there's a question. You did a good job. No Thank you. Questions. Thank you. Senator, glad to have you with us. Come on in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and this August committee. On page four, third from the bottom, is Senate Bill 334. This is Helping Firefighters Beat Cancer Act. Thank you to the great work that the House and then Representative Micah Gravely, we worked together in passing the Firefighter Cancer Act many years ago. It's been a huge uh, benefit to those who have suffered cancer. Myself and fellow firefighters uh, contract cancer at a much higher rate than the average person. This just closes a loophole if they move from one fire department to the next, that they don't have to start the clock over as long as they've been with the fire service for more than one year. Good. Thank you, sir. No questions. Thank you. Jim Williams, go ahead. Thank you, sir. I bring before the committee today House Bill 1115. Um, this was a property tax rollback provision that was thoroughly, thoroughly um, applied and looked at um, on the summer yeah. work committee. It's on page five. I'm sorry, it's on page five. But basically, it allows host and loss to be at the same time. We're increasing two cents to three cents, and with that extra penny, we're going to use that to roll back property taxes in the communities. It's been fully vetted, like I said, through the Ways and Means, Chairman Blackman and um, Representative Kelly, Chairman Martin. Um, Chairman Newton all played a lot of a lot of help with that and and we had a lot of help from a lot of outside sources I don't know if that's helping or hurting mention all those folks no question thank, thank you me. sir appreciate it Chairman Petrie. thank you mr. Ch thank you mr. chairman uh, I bring you today House Bill 56 which actually is on your yellow sheet it's the second down on your yellow sheet on the general calendar uh, chairman this bill very simply uh, changes the uh, Georgia Public Safety Memorial Grant, which we currently have for children of uh, law enforcement officers, firefighters, or correctional officers killed or uh, permanently disabled in the line of duty. We have this grant for tuition for the children of those individuals. This simply 
allows that same benefit to spouses of those individuals killed or permanently disabled in the line of duty in the interest of being able to protect and support their family financially uh, going forward without their spouse. Glad to answer any questions, Chairman. Thank you, sir. No questions. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Go ahead. Come on down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, HB 1167 Blue Sheet, page 5, toward the end of the page. This is the Peach Education Tax Credit. It will increase the state cap from $5 million to $10 million. This is for innovative projects in public schools, programs, and places such as college and career academies. It also raises the limit individuals or couples filing jointly or corporations can donate to try to get the tax credit well to support public education. Thank you, Representative Towns. No questions. Go ahead. Thank you. Victor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I bring to you uh, today House Bill 1253. It's on page four, fourth from the top. 1253 is a combination of two bills. Section one is uh, what was originally dropped as House Bill 999 by Chair Lady Smith, and uh, it creates what we call special rural districts for smaller counties that have experienced decrease in population and revenues and allows them to use shared services. Section two addresses our regional commissions, a problem that they're having at this point with being able to fill quorums and also educational requirements. We're expanding the membership of the regional commission uh, governing boards, uh, imposing some training requirements on that, but we're not changing their quorum requirements. Representative Anderson got a question from you, Chairman Smith. I'm over here by the wall. Thank you very much for bringing this bill, and also thank you for allowing me to amend House Bill 999 to your bill. This is my, this is to help our smaller, poorer counties in the state to combine their resources voluntarily to help them be able to pull down federal and state grants. So thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your participation. Uh, don't see any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Jim. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen of the committee. I present House Bill 1266, LC 550230. It is not on your blue sheet, but it is on the yellow sheet. Mr. Chairman, this bill is not a simple bill. I know we always hear that a bill is a simple bill. It is not a simple bill, but it is a good bill. This bill came from our housing study committee of a couple of years ago. Some of the things that were pointed out to us about cost of housing and some of the obstacles uh, that involve that. What I would want you to know primarily, and I'm going to make this as quick as I can, Mr. Chairman, a working group of the Georgia Municipal Association, the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia, the Georgia Association of Home Builders, the Georgia Association of Realtors, and the Georgia Chamber of Commerce met around the state with part of their, with members of their various organizations and developed this legislation. My good friend Spencer Fry came up with the basic concept and we have worked on that since then. This is a good bill. It doesn't require local governments to do anything. It preserves home rule by offering them options to do things that would, in, that, would, uh, that would incentivize them to make decisions that they make. There's nothing that forces them to do anything. But it would enable them to prioritize their applications for grants and loans, et cetera. That is the body of the bill. I know we don't need to go into greater detail than that. It is a good bill. It preserves home rule. It gives local governments the options to do things that would lower the cost of housing in Georgia, which we need Thank to you, do. Thank you, sir. We got a couple of questions. Uh, Representative uh, Darlene Taylor, I think, Chairman Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had some concerns about the bill. Um, to me, it was a high density growth to be able to do housing in smaller sizes and um, more crowded areas. But it does handicap rural communities that don't need to and don't want to 
um, participate in those. I know you say it is local options, but if they don't participate, they move down the ladder in being able to qualify for grants. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. It does incentivize and give them a chance to move up. Communities and counties of less than 15,000 people are exempted from this, and also cities of, I believe, less than 2,500 are exempted from it. It is all voluntary. Okay, we've got another question. Uh, question of, uh, speaker Pro Tem Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative, I had a question. What are the penalties if you don't uh, take advantage of these options? I don't believe there are any penalties. This has to do with new applications. Uh, they, there are, the bill creates three categories uh, for local communities, workforce and home ownership leader, a workforce housing ready community, and a workforce housing ready expert community. In those, depending on the level you are, you have uh, better opportunities for applications. There are three tiers. They can select various things. They're not forced to do anything. There are various tiers that they can select. To my knowledge, they're not penalized. This is about opportunity that would enhance their application uh, for the grants and so, loans. So further question. Are these applications for opportunities, is this a new program that is not currently available, or are these community grants that are currently available? Uh, this to, is to deal with current things that are currently available. This just changes okay. the law to, incent, to give them enhanced uh, opportunity. And so would you be eligible for these grants if you don't comply with the things that are in this bill? You are eligible, as I understand it, but you, your application will be enhanced by choosing to do some of these things. So some might call that an enhancement. Some might call that um, a penalty. But I guess it's, it could be one could call that a matter of semantics. Uh, I would agree uh, with, the, with the pro tem about that assessment. Got one last question. Chairman Martin. Uh, gentlemen, you're for a question. Certainly, if, Mr. Chairman. Are you familiar that of the grants that get provided as, as it is today? Do all those grants get uh, filled? I'm sorry? Do you, do you believe like in this, this year without this legislation, um, people that are, uh, cities that apply for all these grants, do you, is there money to fill them all today? Uh, I'm assuming your question is, is there money left over every year? No, well, or is there enough money to just fill the, the all the grants that are proposed now. I mean, based uh, on the I do not know an exact answer to that question. My assumption is there are always people who apply who, who are not successful. I assume there's always more demand than there is supply. I, 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 I would agree with that. So f to further that, I isn't it true that what we're doing here is if you don't uh, abide by this new state law, you'll never get one of these grants. I could not say that that is a true statement. I well, don't make isn't the decisions it true, on the grants. Isn't it true that we we just both agreed that? They're not all filled now, and since this puts you at the bottom of the list, as I read the bill, if they're not all filled now, it would be more likely than not that if you didn't abide by these new regulations, that if, in fact we are taking the opportunity for grants away from many of our cities and counties. I would and not that agree. In fact, I is would it not, not agree true with that, that, that does in fact? I would not that, agree that is, with that statement. Well, we, we will have to agree to disagree. It seems to me that this is just how, the, the model for how Washington does things to us as a state and tells us if you don't do this, you don't get your grant and forces us to do things that we don't want to do. And uh, isn't it true that I have a concern about doing that to our cities and counties? Well, as apparent for your comments, you do have a concern. Mr. Chairman, I know you need to hurry, but I will tell you one thing we all agree on, and that is there's a housing crisis in Georgia and a housing affordability crisis. Our Georgia working families, our young people, deserve to be able to buy a home to build some equity and some financial stability. This is an optional thing. They can choose to, to adopt some of these. It is optional, and it is a good bill. And Thank we you. need to Thank do you. something Thank about you. housing we, in Georgia. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're going to agree that y'all are going to... Uh, Senator, come on up. Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a good bill, too. <laughs> uh, my, <laughs> I picked up on that. Uh, the, uh, 
Senate Bill 443, yellow sheet, general calendar, page 7. Uh, this is a bill that is a little time sensitive in that uh, an event uh, that is held on Tybee uh, has been unpermitted, unsanctioned, and has been costing uh, Tybee Island Last year cost them $187,000 uh, for you know simple things like porta potties, security, uh, roads were blocked, uh, EMS was blocked. So if you become a nuisance to the city for EMS, police, uh, fire, uh, then the city will be able to ask you to recoup their cost, uh, and that's what it is. It is backed by GMA, ACCG, and uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Senator. Uh, don't see any questions. Thank you, Chairman. Representative Banks, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill is on page two, fourth one up from the bottom, House Bill 996. What this uh, bill will do is allow jailers that have been post-certified uh, to arrest persons found to be in violation of a criminal law that occurs within the jail or within the perimeter guidelines of that jail and uh, to authorize to exercise arrest powers upon any person uh, for whom a complaint or arrest warrant is pending who surrenders into custody. Uh, what we have in Georgia, folks, and a lot of, not, not the big counties, not the Cabs, Gwinnett, Cobbs, and so forth, but the vast number of counties in Georgia are understaffed anyway. What these, uh, what's being done now is when a person comes to turn themselves in or a crime occurs in the presence of a jailer, uh, they have to call in a an, an officer off the road in order to effectuate that arrest. This bill will allow for those jailers that are post-certified uh, to handle that and allow those, those uh, law enforcement officers to stay out on the road and, and answer calls. Thank you, sir. I don't see any, uh, any questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, uh, hold up just a second. We got a special guest back. I'm going to do all of you a favor. Uh, Chairman, Senator Brass, come on up here to the front. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing you all a favor because I know when you go over to the other side of the building, you're going to be treated that way too. You won't have to wait. <laughs> Senator, glad to have you here. Go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, being humble and modest, you know, I was going to let all the little people go first, but. <laughs> Um, I'm just teasing. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here, and um, congratulations to you on and condolences. Um, got a lot of new friends, and soon to have a few enemies. So, um, anyway, I bring you SB 254. It's a uh, it's around earn wage access, which is a new industry in this state. It's been around for just a few years and um, just simply putting in some definitions and a little bit of regulations around this new industry. Consumer protections. Good. Don't see any questions. Chairman, thank you. Well, thank you. You're very nice. Let's come back and see us. Yes, sir. Okay. Rep, that's a hard act to follow, isn't it? Thank yes. you very much. Uh, House Bill 1180 should be on the fifth sheet at the bottom. This, is, this came out of our study committee this offseason on tax credits um, and basically so solidifies the success of film in the state of Georgia. It does a couple of things. I'll try to go over it real quick. The first thing it does is it, it, ca it limits transferability to 2.5% of the state's budget. Uh, it does not limit non-transferable ta film tax credits, just the transferable ones. We felt like we needed to um, make sure moving forward from an appropriation standpoint that we had a clear um, line of sight as far as film, film credits went. It allows this industry to continue to grow as the state budget grows. It also changes the, the minimum spend, the 500000 It makes that a single event instead of an aggregate. Um, that addressed some issues we had around the state where people were doing small one-offs and, and applying for the credit. So it, it really gives the Department of Revenue some clarity and some direction on those. And then finally, it changes the uplift. You know, in the past, you, you saw it was simply just the peach 
at the end of the film. And so now it creates nine different categories and, and a film has to meet four out of nine. Um, and, we, and we did this because we wanted to address certain things that were important to a lot of Georgians. One, uh, growing it outside of the metro area. Um, so now there's a 60 mile radius or underutilized areas, sp specifically rural Georgia and, and hub cities outside of Atlanta. Uh, we also address music using Georgia music in film uh, and obviously uh, post-production post and uh, using Georgia workforce. So there's, there's 10 items on there. You got to do uh, two of them. You have a choice between A or B. So I'll take any questions. Got a question, uh, Representative uh, Park or Whip Park? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Carter, um, Carpenter, or Chairman Carpenter, I should say. You call me Doreen, Casey, I don't care what you call me. Go I ahead. Know, what I you got to say? That. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the bill, but um, are there, would Georgia film and TV workers in any way be harmed under this bill? I don't think so. I think what it does is it gives us a clear path forward so we're not coming in here addressing this issue every year. We give a, we put out some nice parameter as the state budget grows, film will continue to grow. And just if just some doing some off paper math, you're talking about nine hundred million dollars worth of spend. Uh, so I think it's uh, I think it's a great bill. Thank you. Chairman Smith. Thank you. I just want to commend you and your effort to thread the needle on some very difficult ways to solve this problem, yet keep this thriving industry in Georgia. And thank you for that. Thank you. Chairman Blackman had a big hand in it as well. So yeah. you can give him a hug later as well. And Chairman Blackman has a question for you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Carpenter, doesn't this also enhance the investment uh, to a great degree with these various uplifts in Georgia and with the uh, limits in one year uh, for transferability, anything that isn't captured in that year would roll forward. Is that yep, not true? Yeah, that's correct. Um, and like I said, it's not a we're, we, you, it's not really a cap because it changes every year as the budget grows. So I don't know. Most of you've been here a long time now. You've seen that budget grow ten or ten or fifteen billion dollars over the last decade. So it's a it's a great great step forward. Leader Beverly has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a quick question around the five hundred thousand dollars. It's a one-time. It's a yeah, single produ single production. Have you thought about having sort of like smaller production companies aggregate and turn that into a, a fund, and then have that? Uh, I, I, you know, uh, private entities are always a little faster than government. So there is a ten million dollar aggregation opportunity. I wouldn't be surprised to see people um, uh, go that route. To, uh, to, to form uh, holding companies or whatever to do that. So, if, you know, the, at the end of the day, though, we want to make sure we're getting the best bang, bang for the bucks for the taxpayers. So um, we can obviously, if we feel like people are taking advantage of this legislation, we'll address it in the future. Thank you, sir. No more questions. Appreciate you guys. Representative Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. If you would turn with me to the top of page three. House Bill 1040 sets standards around the solicitation of what's called mortgage trigger leads. A mortgage trigger lead is when you apply through your lender for credit. The credit union then the, the credit agency then sells your information to other lenders uh, who then solicit you for credit. Uh, this sets sta solicitation standards around how they're able to do that. Hey, no questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Representative Donahue. Chairman Donahue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I come before you on an annual easement conveyance. This resolution authorizes the state of Georgia acting through the state properties and it's 11 HR 1134 from the top. I'm sorry. On the first page, fourth from the top, HR 1113. The resolution authorizes the state of Georgia acting through state properties commission to grant easements over certain state owned properties as listed. With this every year, this gives the right for easement to be paid for Georgia power, our EMC companies, our 
gas public companies to come on to our state properties. And through that, what they basically do is have the right when we're out of power to trespass across to fix problems we have. Most of the charge is $10. Some of them are $650 if it's not a part of the, the properties that are owned by the state. Pretty much we had 13 easements. We passed a bill, some of you remember Calvin Hill when he was here. Calvin started a bill and I was blessed to finish the bill to where every representative and every senator has that option to look at anything that comes in their district and they can approve it or disagree with it and then bring up for discussion. And we do have that and that's a great process. At this time, everyone has agreed on the easements. Thank you, sir. I don't see any questions. Thank you. Mr. Reeves. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I present House Bill 1113 on page uh, three. The, the last uh, bill was House Resolution 1113. This is House Bill 1113. This is the nonprofit donor privacy bill. We would be the 18th state to enact a similar uh, law. This law protects uh, nonprofit donors from being uh, having their contribution uh, gathered and disseminated by a government of official at the state level or state agency. Uh, this uh, makes the policy of Georgia, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court decisions that have said you have a right of free speech and freedom of association with your nonprofit contributions. It ultimately helps those in need. Uh, with charitable donations, it, uh, we would be the 18th state uh, to enact this. So those uh, larger charitable donors who care about anonymity and privacy uh, would uh, be able to give freely to Georgia causes without fear of disclosure and getting hounded or, God forbid, uh, retaliated against for their uh, charity and nonprofit contributions. It was thoroughly examined by the House Government Affairs Committee in three different hearings, and I uh, request uh, your favorable recommendation. Thank you. Thanks, sir. I don't see any questions. Thank you. Come on up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I bring House Bill 1182. It is the second one down on the very back page of the blue sheet. The LC 500791S. It uh, updates the low income housing tax credit, uh, which is now being defined on the top of page two as affordable housing, as affordable housing projects. Um, what it does, it reduces the amount of the federal credit with Georgia uh, would pay 100% of that. It reduces that down to 80% of the federal housing tax credit, except for five uh, uplift criteria that are listed on the bottom of page two. Uh, if it's located in a rural area, receives or prioritizes the majority of its units for seniors or provides a preference for veterans or first responders, provides access to stable and high-frequency transportation, consists primarily of a rehabilitation or renovation, or is owned by a housing authority. All they have to do is meet one of those criteria to get 100% of the federal uh, allotment. And it also, uh, on page four, it adds some uh, transparency uh, with respect to the Open Records Act to that, and uh, that's essentially all it does. Thank you, Representative Crow. We have a couple of questions. Whip Park has a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can you explain why this bill cuts the low-income housing tax credit to 80 percent? Well, what it does is it affords an opportunity to raise up to 100 percent, but we're dealing with federally subsidized government housing already that we're using taxpayers' money of the people of Georgia to further subsidize. What we're doing here is we're making sure that while we're still maintaining the program, we're getting the best economic outcome for the taxpayers of Georgia and targeting it in a way that would be most advantageous to the people of Georgia. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, somebody hit a button back 62. Don't see it. Okay. No other questions. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to come in today. I'm here to speak on Bill HB 1053, which is on page three of the blue sheet, third from the top. The Federal Reserve is contemplating the creation of a central bank digital currency. If there were ever a bill that I would hope would be bipartisan, it should be this as this bill is about the fundamental right to privacy of every person 
in this chamber, every citizen in this state, and every person in America. In addition to the creation of a CBDC by the Fed, uh, the creation of a CBDC by the Fed would undermine our banks and credit unions, which is why this legislation is supported by the Georgia Bankers Association, the Community Bankers Association, and our credit unions. HB 1053 will discourage the creation implement and implementation of a CBDC by the Fed uh, by Georgia failing to participate in any uh, pilot program uh, for the Fed in this and also directing state agencies to not accept this method of payment if the Fed does decide to move forward with this. And that's all I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Representative Baby. We have a question for you. Whip Park has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How does this bill impact privacy when it only limits spending by state agencies and again when no privacy interests are otherwise impacted per the language of the bill? The goal of this bill is to discourage the implementation and the creation of a, of a CBDC. It affects privacy because essentially, uh, Whip Park, um, the government will know every single thing you do with your money. They'll know exactly where you are and where you're spending it, exactly what you're spending it on. And I just think that is the paramount uh, invasion of privacy. Uh, the irony of this is the Federal Reserve was created in 2013 by President Woodrow Wilson. By a, 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 and, and the idea of the Fed was conceived by a Republican, Nelson Aldrich. 2016, the president uh, nominated Louis Brandeis to the Supreme Court, and Louis Brandeis was a huge champion for privacy. So it's just hugely ironic that this should be an enormous bipartisan bill, and that Louis Brandeis, strangely enough, was a Republican up until, two, uh, until 1912 and was a Democrat thereafter. And, Th 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 thank you for your answer. Okay, thank you, Representative Baird. Don't don't see any more questions. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Senator, come on up. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen. Bring to you Senate Bill 348, which is on the bottom of page four, next to the bottom. This has to do with getting death certificates signed and defining what is a physician's responsibility or a medical examiner's responsibility. Right now, the time limit is 180 days, six months from the time uh, a physician has talked to their patient, prescribed a refill of medication to their patient. This just changes it down to 60 days to two months. And this is uh, an issue that's been, uh, been a confusion between medical examiners and family physicians for many years. Okay, thank you, Senator. We got a question. Uh, Chairman Hawkins, you have a question? Yeah, I'd like to ask the gentleman, in his opinion, should a non-physician be signing death certificates? Should a non-physician? Right. Uh, Say an APRN or PA? Um, yes, sir. Uh, in some situations, it certainly should, especially when the person has been under uh, medical care of a physician and extended care facility or even a hospice facility. In my opinion, the physician has already made a diagnosis, prognosis as to that patient's um, life and any occurring illness that they might have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I don't see any more questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your consideration. Yes, sir. Do we have some members with uh, requests? Uh, Chairman Martin. Mr. Chairman, I bring to you House Bill 1181. This comes out of the, the committee the speaker appointed uh, this summer about um, bringing our tax credits and exemptions um, together. Um, we're shortening the uh, carry forward on some of the tax credits. We're bringing forward a consistent um, date for sunsetting of some of the sales tax exemptions. To be clear, Mr. Chairman, anyone that has a tax credit, the carry forward uh, date being shortened will not impact them. Um, th this impacts a number of exemptions and credits. So if, if a member has a question about a specific one, I'll be able to do it. In the interest of time, I would do that offline unless the chairman wants me to do it this morning. We'll talk about it later. Any other, any questions? If you have a question, raise your hand. Any questions? Okay. Uh, 
Jim Carson, you have a request? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I bring to the Rules Committee House Bill 1192. This concerns the sales tax exemption um, for our high-tech data centers. What this does is provides basically a pause on issuing new certificates of exemption from July 1st to June 30th of 2026 for us to study this for a couple of years. It also uh, uh, creates a commission uh, to do just that. I have a, another bill, if I may? Yes, sir. I believe um, Senate Bill 352, this is on the back of page four at the bottom. What this does, um, and I've had to learn a lot about this issue, but it's, uh, it has to do with vehicle suspension, came unanimously out of the Motor Vehicles Committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what this does is basically get rid of the, what's called the Carolina squat. <laughs> where the back end is lowered substantially more than the front end, and it also uh, does away with or repeals some language in lines 15 through 23 that's ambiguous, that is concerning to industry, limiting the number of jobs created in Georgia. Thank you, sir. I don't see any questions. Any other members? Okay. Representative Cannon. There he is. Come on down, please, sir. Bill number. Let's see here. Just so I can get to it. Is it twelve thirty seven? Top. <laughs> All right, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the, for the time to get over here. Uh, catch my breath. Very simple bill. <laughs> no substitute. Uh, this is a Department of Ag bill uh, for the Citrus Commodity Commission. I carried the bill last year as my first bill. And uh, it's just a second. All right. So the, uh, the original bill defined a producer as someone based in acreage, uh, an acreage amount. And the uh, Commodity Commission, after meeting for a couple of times, figured that'd be tough to quantify. So they want to redefine producer in the marketing order and just strike the language uh, out of the bill that talks about acreage quantifying a, a producer. And they will actually do the production based on tonnage, just like blueberries as opposed to acreage. That's all the bill does is striking language out. It's a department bill, and I uh, appreciate your favorable consideration, and thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. I don't see any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Chairman Newton, did you have a bill you wanted to present at 1090? In 1023? Uh, yep. Chairman I, Newton. I already ahead. did uh, 971 on safe handling and storage, and then also 1090, uh, 1090. which is foster care. Yeah, okay. Do I need to present it again, or I yeah. thought I did. We've already, go ahead and ask. Okay, yeah, the House Bill 1090 is, a, it builds on a program that we started a couple of years ago that recognized the unique need of, uh, of children that have been in foster care, that uh, once they reach 18, they're kind of just out of the system. Um, Fostering Success Act, or uh, House Bill 1090, will uh, amend the program to make it stronger to allow those children, well, I'm sorry, now adults, but former foster children in, in, in high needs areas to be able to get the mentorship, the assistance with, with life expenses if they go to a vocational school, college, or other training uh, to help them make the, a proper transition to, uh, to adulthood, to successful adulthood in a very needy population. The bill just uh, uh, puts some safeguards around the money to make sure it's, it's not all spent on administration. It actually is spent directly to benefit the former foster child and uh, expand some of the entities that have tax obligations to use their tax, ob a portion of their tax obligation to help the program get to its max that's been approved by this body. Good. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Chairman Williams, you have a bill to present, right? You recognize yes. me, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. 
Uh, yes, sir. I'd like to, on page five under structured roof, fifth bill down, House Bill 1023. Uh, quite simply, this this bill uh, continues the longstanding tradition of having businesses pay the same effective tax rate as the personal income tax. It also extends the uh, uh, reporting period for Georgia corporate tax returns by 30 days for the deadline to allow uh, corporations more time to accurately file their state of Georgia income tax returns, thereby um, eliminating as many um, 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 redos on their taxes, if you will. And finally, it will uh, it eliminates the net business net worth tax. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. We do have a question. Whip Park has a question. Thank please. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Williamson, I appreciate the bill, but is it not true that 75% of these corporate tax cuts would go to those in the top 5% of earners? No, no, sir, I don't believe that's true, uh, but it's a good question. As you might be aware, we passed House Bill 149 um, a couple of years ago. Overwhelmingly, the majority of businesses, and we, you mentioned corporate, we're talking about small businesses as well, partnerships, multi-member LLCs, as well as S corporations, all of which taxes flow to the personal income tax return. So absent this legislation, which has always been in effect, we will have a de facto rate tax increase on the small businesses of Georgia. In a recent study by the Georgia Public Policy Foundation and the Buckeye Institute say that any for every $1 additional cut in business taxes yields $2 worth of economic activity or growth, which further stimulates our economy. And unlike the personal income tax cut bill that you, you kindly voted for recently, uh, Whip Park, the dollar you save on the, that personal income tax cut, you can take and spend it with your family down in Florida, going to the theme park or going to Yellowstone Park or somewhere out of state, which is fine. That's great. But for every dollar cut in business taxes in Georgia, that dollar stays in the Georgia economy, growing Georgia go jobs and allowing business to uh, continue to prosper. Uh, and that's what it's all about is we, everybody needs a good job in Georgia. So be happy to answer any of the questions. Otherwise, Mr. Chairman, uh, appreciate the committee's favorable consideration of the bill. Okay. Any other questions? Don't see any other questions. Thank you, sir. Okay. Before we uh, move on, we've got a couple little housekeeping items we need to take care of. We've got a couple of bills we want to recommit. Uh, House Bill 464, we want to recommit that to Ways and Means. Is there a motion? Move. Have a motion and several seconds. Any opposition? It's back. House Bill 1039 be recommitted to Government Affairs. Move. Have a, mo a move and a second. Any opposition? It's back. House Bill 1104 to Education. Move. Move and second. Any opposition? It's back. House Bill 1257 back to Economic Development and Tourism. Move. Move and second. Any opposition? It's back. Okay. Now, we already have a calendar today. We want to set a rule supplemental calendar for today. Under modified open rule, House Resolution 1113. Is there a move? Got a move and a second. Any opposition? It's on. House Resolution 1116. Move and second. Any opposition? It's on. Okay, under modified structure. 481, move second. and second. Any opposition? We have an opposition to 481. All those in favor of putting that on, raise your right hand. All opposed? It's on. House Bill 827, move and second. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 927. Move. Have a move and a second. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 957. Move. Move and second. second. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 1028. Move. Have move and second. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 1040. Move. Move in several seconds. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 1078. 
Move. Move and second. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 1100. Move. Moves and seconds. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 1218. Move. Move and second. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 1237. Move. Have a move and seconds. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 1247. Move. Move and seconds. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 1264. Move. Move and second. Any opposition? It's on. Under structured, House Bill 808. Move. Move and second. Any opposition? Have an objection? All those in favor of putting House Bill 808 on, raise your hand. All those opposed? It's on. House Bill 1090. Move. Move and second. Any opposition? It's uh, on. Okay. Going to go over those again. So we have them. Uh, this will be for the supplemental calendar for today. House Resolution 1113, House Resolution 1116, under Modified Structure, House Bill 481, House Bill 827, House Bill 927, House Bill 957, House Bill 1028, House Bill 1040, House Bill 1078, House Bill 1100, House Bill 1218, House Bill 1237, House Bill 1247, House Bill 1264, under structured, House Bill 808, House Bill 1090. Vice Chair Boundary is recognized for a motion at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, at, this, at this point, I would like to make a motion that we limit all debate on the supplemental rules calendar to one hour time to be allocated at the discretion of the chair. Okay, we have a motion and a second that debate be limited. Is there objection? There is objection. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed, it's limited. In order to make sure we have plenty to do this week, we want to go ahead and set a calendar for Tuesday. Uh, this will be for Tuesday, the 27th, under modified structure, House Bill 451. Move. They have a move and a second. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 598. Move. Move in several seconds. Is there any opposition? House Bill is on. House Bill 880. Move in second. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 974. Move in second. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 996. Move. Move in seconded. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 1127, second, is second. second. Uh, any opposition? It's on. House Bill 1188, move. move in several seconds. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 1251, move, move in seconded. Any opposition? It's on. House Bill 1267, move. Move and seconded. Any opposition? It's on. House Resolution 598. Move. Have a move and second. Any opposition? It's on. Under structured, House Bill 1023. Move. Have a move and seconded. Any opposition? Second. Have an objection. 
All those in favor of putting House Bill 1023 on for Tuesday, raise your hand. All those opposed. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> House Bill 1181. Move. Move. Second, any opposition? It's on. House Bill 1185. Move. Move and seconded. Any opposition? Objection. Have an objection. All those in favor of putting House Bill 1185 on, raise your hand. All opposed? It's on. House Bill 1192. Have moved and seconded. Any opposition? Objection. Have an objection. All those in favor of putting it on, raise your hand. All those opposed? Barely gets by. Uh, it's on. House Resolution 1022. Yes. Have moved and second. Any objection? objection? Have an objection. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed? It's on. Let me go over those again just to make sure we've, everybody's got them. This is for Tuesday. Under modified structure, House Bill 451, House Bill 598, House Bill 880, House Bill 974, House Bill 996, House Bill 1127, House Bill 1188, House Bill 1251, House Bill 1267, and House Resolution 598. Under structured, House Bill 1023, House Bill 1181, House Bill 1185, House Bill 1192, House Resolution 1022. Vice Chair Bounder is recognized for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that the uh, debate be limited to one hour on all matters with tomorrow's rules calendar pursuant to Rule 33.3. Thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Any opposition? Have opposition. All those in favor of limiting the debate, raise your hand. All those opposed? It passes. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I don't see you again today, but we might. Thank you.